I'm going to remember to bring everything up here with me the first time. So, the scripture reading, well, I got water going on, we'll see how that works. The scripture reading that Martha read was actually because I've switched my sermons around, so my sermon next week's going to match much better with what Martha said today than this one. Uh, but that's okay. It's a great passage. I love that passage out of uh, 2 Timothy. But today I want to talk about the glory of God. And what is the glory of God? And what do we mean that we do all things for the glory of God? Well, this goes back to something we've looked at all month where we've been talking about the Protestant Reformation and kind of those core beliefs that those people had and that have uh, throughout the last 500 years has flowed through our churches here as well. And really, four of them can be summed up in this way, that we are saved or we have salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. But as we think of this idea of God's glory and God's glory alone, we must ask ourselves this question. Maybe. What is glory? As I talk about all the time, we love using church words and we don't think about the meaning of them. What does, it, what does glory even mean? Well, really, it's used throughout Scripture in the Old Testament and New Testament, and we use it today as well. But in the Old Testament especially, the Hebrew word of it really has two uh, roots to the meaning glory. It means the weightiness the importance, the significance of. Think about it as the weight of gold, so to speak. speak. Your worth, the worthiness, so to speak. But it also means brightness. And in both of these things, when we think about the glory of God, we have to think of it in this sense. That this is who God is. God is Glory. We cannot do anything to take away from God's glory. That is intrinsically who He is. And He is worthy of our praises. He is worthy of all things because He is the creator of all things. And so I want to look up a couple Bible passages with you today. If you want, you can join me. We're going to be in the book of Isaiah for the first two passages. And then we're going to move on after that. So if you have your Bibles, at Isaiah chapter 42, verses 8 and 9, it's on the Pew Bible, which is the blue Bible in the back of the pews. It is on page 514. But if you're in Isaiah chapter 42, it says this, verse starting in verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare before they spring into being. I announce them to you. And then after that, and we're not going to read it, but immediately following that, there's a song that's written about God's praises, about His mightiness, about His power. I really want us to think about what verse 8 says, though. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Oftentimes we see this, especially in the Old Testament, about the idea that the people of Israel were giving power and credence to idols and saying the idols were the ones doing this or doing that. And God says, I am not going to give my glory to idols or to anything else. And you know, as I was thinking of this, I was like, you know, sometimes I hear people talk about God kind of being a little selfish. Well, God, aren't you being selfish if you're the one going to take all the praise? Are you not just like this egomaniac and you just want all of it for you? Let's think again about what glory is. 
weightiness, the worthiness. Who is worthy of praise? Who is worthy of worship? There's only one being worthy of worship, and that is God. So no, he is not being arrogant. He is asking for what is due him and him alone as he is the creator of all things. And as I was thinking about that, I was even thinking of Isaiah chapter 6. We're not going to turn there. You can turn there later and read the story about Isaiah where it talks about these angelic beings that were flying and they was looking upon God's glory, but they actually wouldn't even look upon him. They would have their wings. The seraphim would put their wings over their eyes so they couldn't even look at God because they weren't worthy to look at God. We read in the Old Testament, we read in the book of Revelation about... uh, People going and they find an angel and they lay down and they start worshiping the angel. And the angel's like, no, 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 don't do that. Get up, get up. There's only one being worthy of worship and it's not me as an angel. It's God. And so we see this throughout that these heavenly beings recognize who God is. And we need to as well. And so now if you're still in Isaiah, just probably turn one page. It might be on the same page in the Pew Bible. I don't know. I, yeah, it starts on the same page. Isaiah chapter 43. And we're going to read a few more verses here, though. We're going to start in verse 5. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And whoever and everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Let them lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Which of them foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring in their witness to prove they are right, so that others may hear and say, it is true." You are my witness, declares the Lord and my servant, whom I've chosen. Now, when we read Isaiah, when we read the prophets, we have to realize there's really two meanings involved here. One is a much more historical meaning of something that's already happened. And so God is looking forward to when Israel would be taken captive. And he says, I will bring you all back to Israel. I'll gather you from the north, south, east, and west. You will be my children. Okay? But we also recognize that this also has a more prophetic, more long-term type meeting when they talk about us and our salvation. Why is he bringing them back and what will they be? And he says, everyone who is called by my name, so that includes Christians, not just Old Testament Jews, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Why are we to worship and praise God? Because he made us. He made everything. God even says it right here. But he made this people, and here they're talking about Israel, but we can extend this to the Christian church as well. He made them to do something. Because of his glory, because of all the things that he's done for us, what are we to do in response? We are to lead those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. We are called to be witnesses to prove that our faith is right, that our God is the one true God. And that that is truth. We are called to be his witnesses to this world because of his glory. And so, yes, God does all these things. Our salvation is out of his glory. It's for his glory. 
It says so here. But because of that, we are also called to do other things as well. We are called to live a life in that uh, redemption, so to speak. But that also made me think, uh, I saw Chris walked in late. He's not going to want to hear this. Uh, I was substituting this week. And I had some free time on my hands during the day because at the high school, uh, substituting's totally different when I substitute for fourth grade. So I had some extra time on my hands. He's never going to let me sub again. And I sat there and I, I opened up my uh, tablet and I read the book of Romans. And I love the book of Romans. And... I think it fits really well with our sermon today. So I want to give us a very brief breakdown of the book of Romans. So the Apostle Paul, really, you can break it into two sections. You have chapters 1 through 11 and then 12 through 15. And so in chapters 1 through 11, Paul talks about salvation. He talks about the theology, the deepness of of salvation and guess where he begins he talks about how horrible of human beings we are that we deserve God's wrath that what we do is we substitute the one true God and we substitute him with other gods and we worship the creation instead of the creator and he goes but guess what this isn't just something I have against the Gentiles This is something against the Jewish people because guess what? If you have the scriptures and you still don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, what's the point of you having the scriptures? What's the point of you having all this additional information if you're not going to use it? And then he turns and he goes, but guess what? Luckily for us, We are united whether you're Gentile or Jewish. We're united because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And this is where in this first part he says a lot of those uh, pretty famous things that I talk about a lot. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And he talks about Gentiles and Jews all needing Jesus for their salvation. And he gets really deep in the weeds, so to speak, of this Uh, theology and he talks about what faith is and how Abraham exhibits faith and all this other stuff and then we get to chapter 12 and he transitions it's no longer necessarily as hard-hitting about the theology of salvation and he changes in chapter 12 so if you have your Bible pew Bible it's page 803 but if you have your Bible you can turn to Romans chapter 12 with me Romans chapter 12, and here is where the switch is. He starts in verse 1 and he says, Therefore, okay, because of all this stuff I've outlined, this theological treatise that I have outlined in the last 11 chapters, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so he has this transition. He says, look, if you have salvation, if you have put your faith in Jesus, you don't do it just once. It's a lifetime. Your life should be lived as an act of worship. All these people around you, they're going to churches and they're making all these sacrifices and things like this. They're into these physical acts of worship. I am telling you, living your life, that is the spiritual act of worship. Living as if it matters that Jesus died for you. And so again, we have this idea that all things we do should be done to the glory of God. Paul would then go on and he talks about what that means. That he talks about loving one another. He talks about living in submission 
to the governing authorities of the world. That's a passage we could all probably use today. Talking about how Christians and the government should live together and what that looks like. But he goes back to the idea of loving one another again in chapter 14 where he talks about those that are weak in the faith and those that are strong in the faith. If you're strong in the faith, you shouldn't put anything in the way of the weak so that they may stumble. And they go through and he talks about all this stuff. And when he talks about that, he talks about some dietary laws and things like that. And he just goes throughout the rest of the book of Romans talking about how to live your life in response to God's salvation. How you should live your life to bring glory to God. But it's not just in Romans, it's it's also in the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul talking about dietary laws again. That was a big thing when the Jewish Gentile Christians were trying to get together. He goes through and he talks and guess what he says at the end? I don't care what you do. I don't care, care whether you eat or don't eat, because whether you eat or don't eat, do it for the glory of God. All things, even if you're eating, should be done to the glory of God. Reminds me, I didn't read it this week. We've read the same passage each and every week for the last four weeks. And if you have your Bibles, or if you know it by heart, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 2, because I'm just going to read the end of it. Starting in verse 8 of chapter 2, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Again, all those good works, that it's out there. It's not to puff up you and your salvation. It's not to all of a sudden work your way into salvation. You're doing all those things because God has given you salvation. And because of that, you are living a life in response to it. So when the reformers were talking about being saved uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone... Not only are they talking about how you live your life, which you should live it in response to God's glory, but also that all things are done for His glory. Your salvation is for His glory. His creation is for His glory. Everything is for His glory because that's who He is and what He deserves of us. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for all the blessings you've given us. We thank you for the relationship that we have with you that's only made because of you. We thank you that you, an all-powerful, all-great being, wants to have a relationship with his creation. Even though we sin against you and we fall short and we spit in your face over and over again, Lord. You want to have a relationship with us. Lord God, we praise you and we thank you for that. And we ask you to give us the strength to remember that all things should be done for your glory. Whether we're at work or at school, whether we're in our home life or we're at church, All things should be done for your glory, to praise and honor and worship you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Next song, um, and it's going to be on the screen only. It is uh, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Let's all stand together. Open the eyes of my heart, holy, I want to see you. Please be seated. In Romans chapter 11, right before he makes that transition, what helps him make the transition is the Apostle Paul breaks out into prayer uh, in his writings. 
And so in chapter 11, starting